I'll just, just want to do that it. for now. We can, yeah, as I said, if you want to just do it, we can figure it out later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, as I was saying, um, I couldn't find a better person to present this topic. Amy is um, uh, well opinionated, um, a good, good <laughs> opinions in my, in my mind. Um, she knows which direction that compass should be pointing in as far as breeding practices. And I really, really respect her for that. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Amy Chada, who um, is speaking to us from Indiana. And I'm gonna let you tell them a little bit more about yourself, Amy. And before you get started, let me just remind everybody we are recording. So your presence on, on the Zoomy, um, you know, correlates with you giving us permission to be, to be recording you um, as well as then putting this up on our YouTube channel in the, by the end of the week, hopefully. Um, secondly, um, please mute your, your devices so that we don't hear any background noise. And um, we'll take questions and answers uh, towards the end, but go ahead and type your questions um, into the chat box or the chat icon at the bottom. And um, Matt uh, will help us moderate that session when it comes to Q&A. Okay, Amy, you're on. Okay, good morning. Um, so yes, I, uh, I actually co-wrote this with Rose Shacklett of Glendara Scottish Terriers, who she and I have been co-breeding about 20 years, 21 years um, for a mutual benefit, which has been great. Um, we used to be about nine hours apart and now by chance we're two hours apart. So we're a little bit more involved, which is great. Um, so, and I've been in rescue much longer than I've been breeding. Uh, rescue since I was in my early twenties, I used to do uh, multiple breeds of terriers and now it's all Scotties because uh, there's plenty of them and uh, you know I this presentation is going to involve rescues too about how to find those as well we had a presentation about rescue and what it's involved but it is definitely an option um, but the focus of this is uh, finding a breeder um, that you can work with long term because that's what most people are interested in um, you know, they want a companion, they don't necessarily want to show in most cases, but they want somebody they can call on, they can, cut, you know, count on. And that seems to be a question I get a lot. I think all breeders uh, that are at shows in different places get that question a lot. So we've put together some bullet points here. Um, I know there'll probably be a range of questions and that's fine. Just keep talking typing them in and uh, we will you know get through them as we get through them in the middle and the end. I didn't make it an extremely long presentation for that reason, but I just wanted to hit the most important things that we felt um, to help sort of educate people about what they should expect, not what they should accept, what they should expect from their breeders. Okay. So where do you start? And I've got sort of green and yellow here. Um, our top one is recommendations from friends to a breeder. Somebody they've worked with already, somebody they have contact with, somebody who checks in on their dogs. That is the most important uh, thing that you can get. And also it helps you um, get in and contact with that breeder. Obviously rescue is an option as well, but there's a range of rescues out there. Um, the National Club website has a breeder referral that will include National Club members that have signed a code of ethics. Um, the AKC does have a list of breeders. There is always vetting that's needed um, because anybody who does AKC registration can uh, put their information there, but it's a good place to start. Dog shows are a great place, but understand people are stressed, they're getting their dogs ready, they're nervous, um, they may need to run off and get a picture, but when there's a break in between there, introduce yourself, just let them know what you're interested in, get their information and contact them later, or find a time uh, when after the shows are over that you can sit down and chat for a little while. Um, don't assume if somebody's acting a little bit brusque, it's because they don't wanna to talk to you, 
Um, it's usually because we're a little bit nervous. <laughs> so <laughs> Facebook is a place to find um, dogs. It's unfortunately, and fortunately, been a good place for breeders to link up uh, with each other and to find references for uh, good homes. But it also is a place for people to put information out there that may not necessarily be correct. So you always have to do your research about the breeders that uh, show up on Facebook and really don't show up anywhere else. They don't show up in dog shows. They don't show up any in their in others. And website only does occur actually pretty often um, where there's a online waiting list and such. So, but no matter where you find them, there's a lot of questions you should ask. And the, the overall reaching point today is you should keep asking questions. And if your questions are met with resistance, I would move on because most of us breeders will drive you batty with the questions that we have for you. Um, a, a major consideration as you look for your uh, first dog, your next dog or whatever, is how far away is that breeder? Are you willing to travel? Are you uh, willing to do a transport service? There's options available, of course. There's people that will fly your dogs across the country for you. Um, is if it's, you're going to get a young adult from a breeder or an adult, will it fit in a Sherpa bag and has it been trained for that? So that is a kind of a, a first consideration if, if someone within reasonable driving distance is your only option. And then, of course, what of type do I want? And what I mean is, do you, do you want to show? Do you want to possibly breed? Um, there is an extensive amount of research that needs to be done there because you're going to be partnering with somebody who is going to be mentoring you over a period of time. You know, if you say companion only, which I say this is somebody who has a lot of companions running around her house, some of which may show at a dog show every now and again. Um, mine are companions first and show dogs second, of course. Um, but if you want to spay and neuter, or if you, uh, you know, want to have a, a, a great house dog uh, and family dog for you, um, they should still come from the same breeders. We should be looking for people who are looking for specific temperaments, that they're looking for clean health and they're raising them properly. Um, do you want to work? If you want to work your dog in a specific vein, find out what else that they have done. Um, and what the kind of temperaments they're, they've got. You know, therapy, uh, Scotties are kind of rare, but they are fantastic. Um, they're really, really good in my opinion, uh, just from my experience over about 30 years for memory care. I've had fantastic uh, results with memory care with Scotties and also just doing tricks and such for children. Um, and then are you looking for a puppy or are you looking for an adult? Okay, so I have to move this grid here. Um, this is a situation I've been asked to address. What if I want a companion? My breeder says the puppy that's been chosen for me is show quality and has to be shown. Um, that is your choice, uh, whether or not you want that dog to be shown or whether you're going to wait uh, for another dog that then will eventually be spayed or neutered instead of shown and bred. Just be 100% sure what it is that you are willing to do and what the potential cost is uh, before you walk into a, a contract because not every dog that is show quality should necessarily be shown and it's up to the breeder whether they want to wait for somebody who's gonna show and breed that dog or whether or not they're gonna let it go to a, to a companion home. Okay, so I, being who I am, I can't get away with not saying this. When you're looking for a new companion, the most important thing isn't color. I mean, everybody, we all have color preferences. If I match you with a dog that isn't in your preferred color, are you gonna walk away from it? That's your choice. Um, if you're willing or are you willing to wait, are you willing to wait till a Wheaton girl of the right temperament uh, comes up for you? Um, there aren't any genetic strengths or weaknesses associated with specific colors. And anybody who tells you that there's any impact of breeding specific colors to other colors um, has any genetic weakness is not informed for sure. 
Um, you can breed wheat to wheat and just fine. You can breed black to black just fine. There is no issue with that. Um, in fact, I've done wheat to wheat several times because it was the best breeding and got some absolutely fantastic pigmentation, which is the most important part. The portion around the, the nose leather, the eye rims, the feet, that kind of thing. And what is more important to you? A history of health screening and temperament or color? Sometimes we get all of them in the same one with our pref preferred color, but I, I struggle with this with every litter because I get calls all the time. I want a black female only. I want a wheat and female only. It has to be, has to be, has to be. And I get people who are frustrated with me because I'm letting them know like the black female that's available in my litter is definitely not the right temperament for your household. Um, you know, this is the brindle female I've chosen for you. If they're not trusting that that is, that I feel that's the right dog for them, then I'm going to move on. I'm not going to give somebody an option to say, okay, you you know, I've, I've done this for a reason. So, you know, you've been to a show, maybe you had a first contact on Facebook, somebody's referred you um, to a breeder. What do you do at that point? Um, I mean, obviously you, the first question most people want to ask is, do you have any puppies right now? Of course. Um, yes, you know, but you will probably be waiting no matter what. And I've always said the best owners will wait for the right dog. It doesn't matter if it's a breeder. Or it doesn't matter if it's rescue. If you must have a dog right now, then that raises red flags with breeders. It raises red flags with rescues. Um, ask questions. I have a lot of questions that could be listed. Be prepared to answer lots of questions. Do not be offended by the number of questions that you're asked. It's going to be a lot. It better be a lot. Um, anybody who knows me knows how many questions I ask. <laughs> what do you want to do with your puppy? Again, uh, you're going to be asked that question a lot. And your readers, uh, your readers should be your lifelong support. So if you get a reference from someone that says, I got this puppy from so-and-so, the questions back to your friend would be, how often do you check in with them? Do they ever check in with you? Um, have you heard any follow-up from them over a period of time as to say a health issue or any kind of finding or just check in on health? What has been your communication? Or is it, I got my dog and I haven't heard from him, the dog is eight years old. Um, are you comfortable talking to this person? And again, if you don't develop a rapport with them, no matter how nice it might be, if you're just not comfortable and you just don't jive, it's better to move on, just like anything. And do they use a contract? Not everybody does. A lot of people do verbal because they've developed a long relationship. I always use a contract and I do that because it prevents hurt feelings. It gives everybody some sense of comfort. And I actually have two, two versions, two versions, two copies of the same contract that are both inked so that everybody gets an original. Uh, for their records. Um, and and sort of likewise, if you say, okay, well, I, I'm looking for a puppy, I'm looking for an adult. I'm also found these different rescues in my area. Um, and again, you'll probably be waiting. Um, and you should ask questions. You should just accept what's offered and answer lots of questions. My goodness, uh, the screening process is, should be good. Same as a breeder, rescue should be around. They shouldn't be fly by night. Um, do they use a contract? Everyone I know does. So for questions, it goes long. How long have you been in Scotty's? You know, I've been in it 50 years. I've been in it 20 years. I've been in it five years. Five years wouldn't necessarily be a, a red flag if it's somebody who's being mentored um, by a national club member to learn how to breed properly and how to do what health testing needs to be done. Where do you register your puppies? Because if they go to the Continental Kennel Club, you can register Labradoodles. You can register any dog without a pedigree. You just have to provide a picture that shows a reasonable facsimile of the breed, and they'll register it, I believe it was for $10. So there isn't a history required um, for a lot of kennel clubs. And again, it's not Canadian Kennel Club, it's Continental Kennel Club. 
and there's also American ACA. There's several different ones out there. Um, what you're looking for is a history uh, where they are not taking the same stud and the same females and the same stud has had 30 litters at their house uh, over the last five years or even eight years. That's not, that's not breeding for the right combinations. That's breeding for puppies. Um, what health testing have you done? Uh, if you hear, well, I did VWD and everybody's clear. It is true, genetically, if, if your parents are VWD tested um, and you breed the same two parents together, I guess you don't have to breed them for VWD again. You have eight litters out of the same ones. But there's a lot of health tests that should be repeated frequently. And, we, and as educated breeders, we know um, what the major hot buttons are in our breed. We all have bladder cancer on the tip of our tongues and I am always screening my older dogs for bladder cancer and I do it early and I check in on all of my puppies over six and I believe me harass them to get bladder screens harass them there's no nice word for it <laughs> what health issues have you seen in your breeding my, my answer is bladder cancer I've seen it every single line that I know has seen it um, I've seen it really late in most cases but it doesn't mean that it couldn't creep in earlier. It doesn't mean that this could start to become a major issue. I am always keeping track of that. If somebody says, my dogs are really healthy, haven't really had any problems, the answer is false. 100% chance of false. Um, everybody has seen something. Um, what has been your response to health issues that came up? So if they say, well, we had one dog with this deformity at birth and um, my vet said it probably is nothing. I asked, did you do a necropsy? Um, is this, you know, was it possibly a heart issue? Was it possibly a liver issue? Um, but if they don't know, they don't know. Uh, um, and if say uh, the father of the litter who may be five years old uh, develops bladder cancer, develops something, right? Are they saying, well, I have this dog that developed X. I informed everybody who had a puppy uh, from that male that this is what happened so that they know, right? Um, or is it, uh, well, I noted it and I moved on. You've got to, you've got to help the breed in general. Uh, and you have to do that by informing other people. Um, and again, what if you find a health issue in one of the related dogs that I get from you? And the answer should be, you're going to get a phone call. You're going to get an email. We're going to talk about it. Does this have a possible ramification or not? Um, and then do you provide any health guarantees? And that's a bit tricky, of course. There's certain things that we can guarantee against because we can fully test. Um, things like uh, a guarantee against all genetic health issues for a year is incredibly generic and almost not enforceable. Um, again, it, for me, it comes down to the person you're working with, their knowledge and their longevity and their ability to be clear that they are gonna be honest about what's going on. And then it, it, it's not, if you ask somebody who's just a casual breeder, can you provide me references? They're gonna have a stack of a couple of people that they send out frequently that are happy puppy buyers. They're not gonna send you anybody who wasn't quite happy with their placement. Um, but if they can provide references from other breeders, especially say in a kennel club, especially say in the national club that or a local club that know this person, have been around them, have seen them at the shows, have you know, met their dogs, that is gold. If you can get references to other breeders doesn't mean you're going to have a super long conversation with the other breeder, but it does mean that other people in the industry respect what they're doing. Uh, and it is kind of an industry. It kind of has to be by definition, right? Um, of course, rescue adopters too. Um, always lots of questions. Are you a breeder of merit with the AKC? Quite a lot of the STCA National Club members are. And that means we've met certain health standards. We have a certain number of champions. So we don't say our dogs have champion pedigree. 
we see our dogs are champions, not that there was a champion uh, one out of 64 in the pedigree. Um, what health tests do you do before you place your rescues? Because rescues can be pop-up, they can be profitable, and they can be non-profitable. Um, and so there is a certain uh, amount of health testing that every rescue should do. Um, like general blood work, if the dog is over a certain age, we screen bladders if they're over a certain age or have any issues. Uh, we do heart room testing. We make sure they're up to date on shots. If they need a dental, they get a dental. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Um, or do they do a rabies shot and send them out and say for $200 and then you need to do the rest? Um, that may mean there's some either some uh, funding issues or there's sort of a lack of you know, involvement. Um, if you use a contract, can I see an example? There should be a blank one out there that they can provide you um, that you can read. And I always provide that ahead of time before people get puppies if they haven't gotten one from me before because they may have questions. Um, how many litters do you usually have in a year? If the answer is five or six, I kind of wonder. Uh, you know, what is the reason for that? Are you keeping a puppy from most of those litters, meaning you're breeding for yourself or are you breeding and that is your source of income? Do you register your health results uh, with the OFA? That's been the traditional place um, where if we register the uh, minimum set of results, you can get what's called a chick registration, meaning you've met a certain standard. When is your next plan litter and what is your usual weight for a puppy? Obviously plans go awry sideways and up and down. Um, but you know, if they're saying, well, I'm gonna breed another girl in a couple of weeks and then I'll have another one a month behind that. And then um, you should probably think twice about whether or not they can properly handle and raise these puppies because Michelle's done it too, uh, raised huge litters and uh, I just about died a year ago raising my seven. <laughs> uh, do you place older dogs? Um, that's an individual thing. Um, some do, and they're able to breed a little bit more because they don't keep the large household like I do. I don't generally place my older dogs. Unless they were unhappy here, I don't, and that's just my setup. Um, but it does occur. Um, there's some breeders that are really, really excellent at really finishing all of their show uh, potential puppies and they'll place most of them right after they finish. Um, so you'll get a finished champion who will probably go on to be neutered or spayed um, so that they get more champions, but then you still get the dog when it's fairly young. There's also five or six year olds that are placed after they're done breeding. Those are often excellent dogs as well, um, but you should make sure that you meet these dogs that their temperaments are gonna match yours. They may not come from the same type of home as yours. And if they come from a kennel situation, they may have a little bit of difficulty uh, living in a home. So again, ask the questions. If you don't get answers or you get evasive, um, then you know move on. Um, and then rescues, how often do you get puppies in rescue? There are rescues. I lived in Kansas City for 15, 16 years. Uh, first-hand knowledge, I saw a van full of puppies that had been bought as rejects um, from the puppy mill distributors that go to Petland and such. And so I just, and, and I was sold right straight out. We give them a few bucks, uh, like 25 bucks a puppy. And, and then we placed them and there was Jack Russell puppies going to Jack Russell people and Westies going to Westie people and Scotties going to Scotty people. That's not a rescue. That's paying Puppy Miller's direct money uh, to continue doing what they do. I'm not, I'm not on board with that. Um, more questions. Um, would you read a dog with less than ideal temperament? And if you did, why? Um, is it because the dog's a little under socialized and has improved dramatically over the last two years and is nearly up to speed? Or like say you some you know the puppy from someone else, um, but if they're describing dogs that may be aggressive, that may have whatever issues, mm, say I'll wait for another litter or or go elsewhere. 
Um, what should I expect regarding temperaments of Scotties in general? It's amazing how many people don't know. We've all encountered that. They have no idea. Um, but you'd be surprised what answer you can get from sort of cold calling breeders. Um, what specifically do you breed for regarding temperament? There is a range out there. There are Scotties that are very independent and there are Scotties that are more people oriented. Um, and nobody would probably be able to guess from my household who's the most people oriented or have guessed. They know now. And that would be Eric, um, who is literally checking in on me regularly. Who would have thought the alpha male uh, is the biggest cuddle buddy you ever met on the planet? You just never know, right? Um, how, how often do they get eye, skin, or ear infections? That's important. Skin infections, especially that are regular can be, you know, allergies and immune issues. Uh, and again, if there were been any allergies reported, they should say, yes, no, I don't know. Um, you know, if they've had, uh, say, 100 puppies in their lifetime, something has been reported from some of those puppies, for sure. Um, questions you should be prepared to answer, and there's going to be a lot. There better be a lot. What's your history with Scotties? And what other animals do you have now? That's always important. What is your work, travel, activity schedule? You know, if you're gone for 10 hours a day uh, and you have no ability to potty the dog at lunchtime, you know, there's no arrangements that can be made. Maybe you also have a commute on top of that. That's probably not the right time to get a dog of any kind. Maybe you should get a cat. I can't believe I said that. Um, do you have children in what ages? This is always a hot button with ethical breeders. It is always. It is a rare situation in which we would place with dog, children under five. It doesn't mean it hasn't happened. It doesn't mean that parents have been, uh, the, you know, who have been responsible, have a current Scotty, and show on video, which I've seen myself and placed a dog in that situation um, where they have plenty of training with their children at 100% supervision and they go to classes with their puppies to make sure they become good citizens. Uh, it's just excellent. But that kind of effort is, you know, extensive. Um, do you have a pool? Is it fenced? And if it's not, will you fence and lock it? Some breeders, if you fence and lock it, will place with you. Some people will not place with you no matter what, if you have a pool. Don't take it personally. It is always a personal decision about where dogs are gonna go. Um, do your pets now or in the past go to the vet regularly? I'm amazed at how often I hear, you know, my dog hasn't been to the vet in two years. And I ask why. Um, it may be money, it may be time, not really an excuse that I've ever taken. Um, can you provide your veterinarian information so we can verify? Um, the sort of the most infamous one for me is a family that indicated, you know, they have a fence. Uh, I did, it was an hour and a half away from me. It was for a rescue check. And I did GPS and I was going to go after I did my vet check to go meet and greet with them. Um, and and such, and I called up their vet, and the vet said, very first thing he said, when I identified who I was, and they had said that their records were clear, he said, you're not going to place a dog with them, are you? And I said, why do you say that? And they said, he said, the last three dogs were killed by a hit by a car. Three. Um, and I called them back, and I asked them about this. And I said, you have a fence. What is, what happened? And it was three dogs over a period of time, not all at once either. And they said, well, we have a fence, but we teach our dogs to be off lead. And so, you know, we turned them down. Um, they were extremely angry about it. Um, so uh, that is su surprising and pretty extreme, but it is amazing when we go to verify information. I would say one in four times they don't match up. Um, can you provide pictures, video tour, home visit, especially for rescues? 
um, where we have other issues as well, but I always require information from the homes that they're going to go to. If I can't travel to their home, there's no excuse not to pick up your phone and have a video tour. There's no excuse not to walk outside and show me the, the edges of all your fence. Uh, I may ask you to shake your fence. Um, I'm that person, right? Um, health testing. Um, this is the sort of the top ones, but there's more. Um, VWD and CMO are genetic tests, so you don't have to retest any individual dog for that. Uh, thyroid testing can be done over a period of time. In my lineage of dogs, it does occur hypothyroidism. It isn't a major deal, but it's still important. Um, I haven't had it before eight years old, um, but it is something that I track regularly to see whether or not it's starting to occur earlier or if it's an autoimmune, because you can have an autoimmune thyroid uh, as opposed to an age-related thyroid. Um, you can do eye testing. You can do it multiple times to track. Um, it is interesting, the findings that Rose and I have had recently, some very minor, but some punctate issues um, that are showing up in eye that are not impacting vision, but the comment that we get a lot is we really don't see very many Scotties at the eye screening. So we need to really promote that more. Heart screening, your general vet can, you know, do puppy checks and can check your dog. Um, we really promote going to a cardiologist. They're almost always at every show. And for about $50, they'll do a heart screen by a cardiologist um, to osculate your dog and really get the best shot at knowing whether or not there's something maybe inherent. They used to be, you could screen them, I think over six months old, um, but I think they have to be over a year now to get a definitive certification. Obviously general health screenings with your vet, uh, which may include blood work, um, which on a dog over, you know, four or five years old should be done at least yearly. And then patellas checking the knees. That is uh, not a major issue in our breed, but it is something that needs to get done uh, in dogs over a year old. And this is, a Michelle sent me this, um, and I found versions of this all over the world. So I'm fantastic. Um, this is a uh, French Bulldog Club of Central Canada uh, put out, you know, green flags and red flags for responsible and irresponsible breeders, which involve a lot of the points that, that I've already included. Are they doing health testing? Um, you know, my dogs are healthy. I don't need to test them. They might look healthy. Um, you might not know. Um, if they've constantly got puppies available, that's an issue. Um, you know, if you've got other dogs or, or whatever, they don't care. And then, of course, here's the references to my happy customers, not to other breeders. You cannot, you know, get that from them. Potential warning signs. Some of you may recognize this because these are some things that I've taken straight off of Facebook from the last week. I have one puppy left. You know what to do. And I'm like, this is in a car, right? Um, this puppy is just waiting for your call again, directly from it. Um, you can pick your puppy at birth. Now, it doesn't mean that that doesn't happen at times where someone may want a wheaten male and there's three wheaten males there. And I can tell somebody, you know, I don't know what dog I'm going to keep, but there will be a wheaten male available and I'm sure I can find the right temperament for your home. It doesn't mean you're going to be picking it. It doesn't mean that, usually, not usually. Ask anybody. I drive the bus when it comes to placement because I want it to be the right dog for your household. I don't want you to pick the really hyperactive dog for your, you know, moderate activity home. Um, and also the, you know, the videos that people show of people coming in and extensively handling them, i.e., potential uh, owners. Um, that's an extreme risk of parvo and distemper in puppies. Other breeders normally are showering out and then showing up at your house and then taking the shoes off, scrubbing, handling, and then going home. Um, handling dogs that young is not really advantageous to the puppies. Um, it is advantageous later on when they need socialization. Um, you know, if you don't get your deposit in, you know, well, you won't be guaranteed to get the next one. And again, it's a pressure thing. 
the last thing that you should hear from any breeders pressure the last thing and if you do i know it's tempting because you really want that puppy think about it think about whether or not you want to work with that person long time i don't believe in vaccinations um this is important for me it doesn't mean they need vaccinations every year there's plenty of information about three year spacing and such. But when you've got zero, including in puppies, I get concerned about that. Uh, I breed my girls on their second season, which would be uh, put them around 16, 18 months old. Um, and every season, that's actually pretty common um, to have six or eight litters uh, in a row. Or I have teacup or miniature Scotties. There is no such thing. Um, I've never had any health problems in my dogs. I saw that on three different Facebook pages this week. Um, my dogs are healthy. I don't need any health testing. Um, that is exactly from two different comments, um, just slightly worded differently, um, from people asking about if they do health testing. And anybody who knows me that knows that I'm the one also asking those questions too, because I like to, to poke. Uh, more possible warning signs. Um, Virtually, um, they won't let you visit in any way. Uh, you know, for people who are close by, later on when my puppies were safe after their vaccinations were going, I had visitors or, you know, we went in a car ride and did a quick visit in the area. But um, to say that, you know, no, I don't let anybody see my puppies and I'll only meet you at some other place, um, that is a huge red flag. People, who don't have optimal conditions and don't keep their places clean, um, don't keep the puppies socialized, they're not gonna let you see what's going on. Um, or they're gonna do, and it happened to me on more than one occasion, steal videos from Facebook and steal pictures and present them as their own uh, litters. Uh, the puppies are placed uh, due to next in line or deposits and not best fit. Um, Puppies are placed before 10 weeks. Uh, the National Code of, uh, of Club of Ethics is 10 weeks minimum. It doesn't mean that every breeder that is a good breeder belongs to the National Club, but they should not be placing them before 10 weeks. There's a reason for that. Um, they don't ask you many questions. That's the biggest red flag that I have. Um, they don't ask you about your history and many will call your vet, be prepared. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to have accepted every single thing uh, requested by your vet, but it means that you should have taken good care of your animals to this point. And then why did you choose to breed these two parents together? Um, if they don't really have a response, you know, he makes good puppies. He has big litter. She has big litter. She's a good mama, uh, you know, whatever. But why did you breed these two together? What is the advantage? to the breed, to having done that combination. And, you know, so then I get the question, like I wanna get a one from a breeder because all the rescues are unhealthy. And these are pictures from, you know, the last uh, few months. And the first two pictures are of a dog to the Scottish Terrier Club of the Southeast um, of a dog that they got in. Yes, extreme examples come into rescue. That's true. Um, and so do these dogs. And so do these dogs. It doesn't mean that every dog that's turned in, a lot of dogs are um, needing homes because their owners have died, uh, have gone to nursing homes, situation has changed. Um, so that may be an option for you as well um, if you are finding, uh, you know, your time, wait for a puppy or an adult is a little bit long. Puppies are very expensive. Oh boy, are they, and this is a hot bucket for sure. Um, so for me, ethical breeders, um, don't breed for profit. That, that is really the very definition in my brain always. It doesn't mean that sometimes we don't break the bank with a litter. It is a miracle, but we do what's called dog math. And that is we try to pretend like all those expenses didn't exist. Um, the prices uh, are set by health testing, proper raising, socialization, veterinary care, microchipping, registration, effort and time. Not every puppy will be microchipped before it leaves because sometimes depending on where they're going, they may not be compatible, but there should be a lot 
of work and love spent there to try to do these things, uh, to try to raise them properly, to try to socialize them properly, to try to make them resilient puppies. Um, and they'll keep a puppy longer. Say you are going to get this puppy from them, but um, you already have a family vacation plan for the first week of December, and that's when they would be 12 weeks old. They'll keep them longer. They're not gonna. They're not gonna want you to get a puppy and go board it right away. They'll keep it longer. And when you get back, um, we'll do the placement. It'll be fine. Uh, for a casual breeder, um, there's going to be generally a for profit, and the price can be lower or higher. Interesting, isn't it? Um, the prices can be thousands of dollars higher, um, and it is driven by pressure. Um, and it's driven by product. Yes, we know there aren't enough puppies for the people always looking. But what we also know is that the best breeders aren't going to put pressure on people to get a dog and they're not going to, you know, wait until they find somebody who's going to pay $5,000. Um, if they have a puppy with problems, they may give it away as opposed to taking care of the problem themselves. Or, um, and this has happened on four occasions in the last few years. They will start a Facebook uh, fundraiser to get surgery for that puppy or whatever care. And I think, were you not saving for the potential of an emergency in your litter? Because if that's the case, you should be taking care of it yourself. Why were you doing this otherwise? If you're counting on the sale of these puppies in order to take care of the next ones, you're not doing it for the right reason and you're putting yourself and the dogs in one of the best situations. And they'll usually require puppies to be taken home by a certain age. Um, it just kills me to see really young puppies in, you know, front seats of cars running around. Um, puppies are very expensive. And yes, rescue can be an option for well-funded uh, rescues that work very hard. Um, we can put in thousands and charge you $400 for the dog. And it's because we do extensive fundraising. And boy, you know, do these groups do that. Um, we, there's no guarantee of long-term health because we're not going to test for VWD unless we think the dog has it, and then we'll do a genetic test. But we will do all the other screenings you would normally do on your own dogs for health. Um, usually puppies in rescue are placed due to rejection by dis distributors, or they've been you know, bought directly, or they've been mm, bought at auction as a pregnant mother. Um, that's a really important issue for me. Don't offer money. Don't find rescues. Rescues. Uh, I'm going to say this, this is my opinion only, but buy from auctions. Auctions used to be extra dogs. Now auctions are pregnant dogs. Auctions are young adult dogs. Auctions are dogs that they know they're going to make thousands of dollars on. They know rescue is there. They're going to let them in because they're going to make 10 times the money on those dogs than they would have made if they had sold them elsewhere. If we're putting money directly like into their pockets like that, we are, we are promoting their breeding practices directly. So um, I'm a scientist, ask lots of questions. Uh, be prepared to wait. If you're not willing to wait, that is gonna be a red flag for an ethical breeder. Um, health testing of the breeding stock, or if it's a rescue, the rescue themselves is important. They need to have that. Um, try not to get too discouraged. Try not to jump on or listen to the pressure. Um, don't take the first puppy offered without research. Sometimes it's going to work out, uh, but most of the time it won't. And uh, on the bottom, let's see, I'm going to point out here. I'm not sure if you can see or not, um, but the bottom two Scotties in this picture are my current rescue fosters, uh, Zoe and Paisley, and then behind that is Chloe, who's the mother of Dash uh, in the other panel, and Luna, who's almost 12, and Tilly, who's on the floor, who's the daughter of Luna. So this was about one o'clock last night. <laughs> they were, well, the uh, Dash's picture is from today, but, but uh, you know, this is the way that, for me, that ethical breeders raise their dogs. They have a couch specifically for the Scotties. <laughs> so, 
uh, that is all in my presentation. If anybody has any questions. Thank you, Amy. It was wonderful as I knew that it would be. We're going to open up um, for questions. If you've got a question, please go ahead down to the bottom in the chat button and type that question in so Matt can handle those. Uh, there's a question from Linda here about will the session be on YouTube. I was going to reply yes, but I wanted to uh, check first and make sure that was okay, uh, that, that this one's going to be all up. Make sure that uh, Michelle, you had gotten permission to put it up so absolutely um yeah that's definitely the plan uh michelle's recording and we'll upload it to the, to the site um carol has a question looking for a scotty with no luck either they're out of her price range or too far to travel for the dog tried breeders looking to rescue with no luck no rescues uh no scotty rescues in the rescue the rescue closed or the rescues too far uh any suggestions would be appreciated so if you would contact me directly i'll probably be able to help you mm -hmm. um we have had rescues transported as far as maine and the rescue uh transport i think uh, vicky would probably be able to tell i want to say it was around 300 dollars or so to get them transported, but there's some good transport services to get dogs all over the place. Um, we've had a rescue go down to Key West, Florida. Um, there's definitely options that way. But yes, if you would message me on Facebook after this, if you're in contact, and then I will try to get uh, the information to you for the best that's in your area. But I'll definitely have some questions for you. Um, what is the OFA? I see that question. That's the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals. And they, uh, of course, that's what people think about orthopedic. They think of hips and elbows. We don't do a lot of that in Scotties. There are some people that have done it in the past, um, but they are also a registering body for um, certifications for health testing. Uh, Jason has a question about Scotty Cramp. Michelle, can he, I'm not sure, can he, is he able to unmute himself? To ask a question or would you have to do that i think he's unmuted oh wait so it looks like he no, i've right. unmuted myself now so i'm ready okay. if i'm able to ask yeah go ahead thank you so much panel uh amy question for you uh i'm from melbourne in australia um got a breeder nearby that has uh had three different litters with scotty cramp mm -hmm. now i know that that's not something that you can test for genetically in the parents uh, you can only become aware of that once the pups are sort of nine or 10 months old. Mm -hmm. Once you've got breeding stock that have produced um, Scotty Cramp pups, like I know how that occurs in the uh, genetics line, is the best advice to remove uh, those parents from your breeding stock as well as the potential carriers? Um, What's your yes. advice over there? So it will depend, first of all, whether or not all the puppies in the litter had cramp um, and whether or whether it's like a puppy in the litter had cramp. Um, it's, you know, also it's going to depend on how valuable the dogs are and how rare that lineage is. Um, and also for me, it's also going to depend on how affected. Ideally, yes, you're going to remove those parents from breeding. Um, in a very mild cramp case of say one puppy in the entire litter um, and it, it isn't repeated, that means that one, each parent has to be a carrier. Yep. But then yep. the question is, is that um, you've got to find another male or female to breed to that has a good history of zero Scotty cramp. You can do testing and that boy, it eludes me the, there's an ejection you can give that will basically induce it in an older dog under stress. Um, I will get that information, but um, it's a good way to test adults because after that nine or 10 month period, uh, a dog that isn't very affected with Scotty cramp can very much hide it. Um, they can be sort of limit the amount of crazy running they do when they get under stress, they may sort of just stop and sit. You'll never see a cramp in those dogs only sort of a moderately to have really affected under say extreme walking or running stress will start to show it because say they're on the lead and they can't, you know, they can't stop. You're not allowing them to stop. 
but um, yep. I'll get that information for you. But there is a way to, to test about whether the parent, one or the other parents is affected. Um, if the reading stock is really valuable, it may be worthwhile taking a, a potential carrier to a very clean line. But you, it's also going to depend on the history of that breeder in terms of have they had enough puppies and have they really followed up to make sure that they know that none of them have it. Um, but yes, it's, it's, you know, and in the past, we, what we thought was sort of um, moderate to severe cramp ended up being uh, CA. And it also could be CA. So that's the question. And um, Charabella or Abiotrophy. And that's something that it can be tested for on video um, and, and determined. So it would be important to find out. I mean, if it is only intermittent, it, it probably is Scotty Cramp. If it happens kind of frequently, it might be cerebellar abiotrophy, which is even more severe. And if it's cerebellar abiotrophy in any of the puppies, both of those parents should be removed from breeding, period, because that means they're both at least carriers of what it can be life ending. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a sticky wicket for sure. Thank you very much. Amy, I'm, Amy, I'm gonna interject here for a moment. Um, Dr. Marsha Dawson is also on the call. And oh, Marsha, if you're available, if you could um, perhaps just share a little bit about the Health Trust Fund's DNA bank project and the, um, the prospect of us looking at um, a couple of generations, I think it is, of dogs who've been affected with Scotty Cramp. Hi, everybody. Nice job, Amy. Enjoyed your presentation. Um, <clears throat> yes, the Health Trust Fund of the Scottish Terrier Club of America is currently, um, has begun uh, a Scotty Cramp research project uh, at the location of our DNA bank in uh, Salt Lake City with Rosero Genomics. And this is taking another look at Scotty Cramp, um, really, really drilling down on specific family members um, and doing this in a very uh, logical procession. What used to take uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars in many, many months uh, has now really uh, sped up. Uh, it's not as expensive anymore, this kind of research. And what they're doing is they're looking at a sire and a dam and an affected offspring, um, looking for a specific marker. Um, and yes, this has been looked at before, but these people are not in academia. These people are in the business of uh, genomics. Um, and they, they have all of the equipment and all of the uh, know-how to take a good look at Scotty Cramp for us, for all Scotty breeders. And uh, we're very hopeful that in the next few months, uh, we will get some positive information back from them. We do have a DNA bank, as Michelle mentioned, a Scotty DNA bank uh, that has been steadily accumulating samples on Scotty's. And it's not just the breeders. It's not just uh, it's not just for the STCA people. This is for all Scotty owners um, that will give us a tremendous uh, wealth and library of genetics on our breed and the preservation of the breed and the preservation of these uh, pedigrees and these bloodlines is extremely important as our. Uh, basically our gene pool gets smaller and smaller over time. So we want to be able to preserve these uh, important and precious specimens uh, and keep control of them, not lose them, uh, not lose them to researchers, not lose them over time. So if there's any, anyone interested in contributing to the DNA bank, Michelle can help you with that as a trustee on the, on the health trust. She can help you with that information. And uh, we are hopeful that this will provide um, a tremendous resource in the many, many years to come for our breed. Thank you so much, Marshall. Uh, Jason, real quick, I just wanna make sure that you saw um, the, uh, the injection uh, uh, comments. Um, yes, I did. And I was, I was listening along with that and I'll, 
already arranged to discuss it offline with Amy. So thank you very much, panel. Um, Sarah has a couple questions here. One, uh, and since we were just talking about it, uh, what is Scotty print? So I guess luckily she's never had to deal with that, but uh, maybe other people don't know what that is since we're talking about it. What is, uh, the question is, what is Scotty Cream? What is Scotty Cramp? Yeah. I, I think maybe people haven't heard of it. Okay. Yeah, it's not that common. We used to see it a lot more in rescues, and it does show up every now and again in certain um, in certain uh, dogs, obviously, as we've just been talking about. But basically, um, it it mainly affects the hindquarters um, and dogs under stress. Um, basically, their hind legs will stiffen up. Um, they do what's sort of called the German two step. Uh, and they'll walk sort of peg leg kind of like, or sort of German two-step like um, in a severe form. Uh, they may be running, but they may stiffen up and they may fall over. Um, in a moderate form, they may just recognize that it's happening and sit down uh, to prevent it for about 30 seconds or so. Um, it, it isn't life ending, um, but it can very much uh, impact sort of the quality of life uh, in a, in, a dog that gets two copies of the gene will get it. I don't know if there's been any recessive forms found, but Marcia may be able to speak to that better. But um, in a severe form, it very much can impact their quality of life, meaning they may be able to walk a block and have to go in a, in a stroller the rest of the way. Um, that has occurred in a couple of rescues that I've had. Um, I've not seen a case uh, personally at my house or in any dogs related to mine, but um, the cases that I've seen that were severe um, were a little bit difficult. And there are some treatments for that as well, um, which include Prozac of all things to increase serotonin in the muscle. And uh, they seem to do uh, pretty well in that. So. Amy, I'm going to pose a, another question here while um, Matt is just reviewing the, the remaining ones that may be there. Can you just reiterate um, the point of why it's important for me not to spend $500 on a Scotty puppy and make choices regarding going with the breeder who's going to charge more mm -hmm. um, if I don't want a show, a show dog? Right. Um, you know, if, if, your dog should come from the same lineage and the same breeding and the same care as somebody who's raising dogs for themselves. I'm raising puppies that I wanna live with. Um, I had to, I usually pick the most challenging one for myself, which is probably not smart, but that's what I do. Um, but I want dogs that are what I call bulletproof. I want dogs that come in a situation, get a little freaked out, so I got this and they move on with their lives, um, which means that I need to spend a lot of time giving my puppies challenges. I need to train them a little bit. I need to give them lots of different experiences. Um, they cannot just sit in a whelping box for a month and then they can't just move into my living room for a, a month and then I place them at eight weeks old. Those dogs will be cute and they will need so much more work because you have lost the ability to properly socialize these puppies. If you take puppies that are in three weeks old and you play thunderstorms and lightning and fireworks, they will twitch a little bit and they will not really respond because their nervous systems are set up at that point to take things in and get used to it. I'm not doing the, shh, you know, uh, keep, keep it quiet around the house. I'm throwing books on the floor and I'm banging pans and I'm doing things to make it so that their nervous systems are properly socialized at the right times, which means if I had overlapping litters, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how I would ever get that done. It, it can happen if you're home and you're retired and that kind of thing. Um, you can ask Rose because she did that once. <laughs> and it, it was difficult. And her husband was constantly doing the work too. So if you want a dog that at 12 weeks old goes, I'm out of here, right? Um, this is great. This is my person. I'm so excited. As opposed to a dog that's like, I'm unsure. I don't know why it's happening. Um, doesn't really want to meet new people. Is, uh, you know, has a string of health issues. 
I was always taught from the beginning, you can pay now or you can pay later. Um, my first Scotty um, was a rescue that came into the foster rescue I was working with. Um, he was teeny tiny. He was given up by the breeder to my vet because he was too small and he clearly had major issues. When it turns out he was just getting bullied. And um, that dog came to me. I never let him go. And he lived to be 13 years old. Now he um, had Scotty cramp. He also uh, had a lot of allergies. He also had a lot of vet bills associated with those. He was a wonderful dog. He was free. Uh, but he probably cost me $15,000 for that free talk <laughs> over that time frame. As opposed to Luna, who is almost 12, um, she's had a space surgery, she's had two litters um, and her regular checkups and her, and her bladder checks, um, you know, and she's healthy as the day she was born. Um, it is the case that, yes, things do happen. Breeders that are legitimate if you have a dog that ends up with a genetic issue, they're going to help you. If you have a dog that ends up with a health issue, they're going to help you. Um, they're going to support you. They're going to be there for all of that. And they're going to back up what they say. Um, if you are going to just try to get a Wheaton girl and you need to have it in the next month because that's what's in your mind, you will be able to find it. It'll be at some cost. It could be a really low cost or a really high cost. But the question is, is what is behind that dog? Do you want a dog that looks great now at 10 weeks old? Or do you want a dog that looks great at 10 years old? And um, for me, successful uh, aging and also a dog you want to live with for 10 years. That's a decade. Do you want a dog that you want to live with? Um, or do you want a dog that you have to constantly make excuses for? Um, constantly have to retrain, constantly have to deal with behavioral issues. Um, that's the question. And so I'm not saying that issues don't happen, but ethical breeders make our best effort at all times. And we put our heart and soul into it, um, which means that we do it to the detriment of ourselves um, so that in the end, other people can enjoy them as much as we do. And that is where I get, you know, my payment because I have not been paid yet. I've been waiting. I'm, new, you know, waiting for that profit on a litter. It's not going to happen. I don't care um, because all the pictures, the videos, and such that I get, and the and the feedback I get are the best part of my day a lot of times, and um, that is what I expect. And so, puppy buyers as well as rescue. Uh, people who have adopted rescues I foster, I am constantly bugging them for updates. I want to know that things are okay. And if things aren't okay, what can I do to help you? And, um, and, and that kind of support is something that you should come to expect. Um, not just think, oh, that's really wonderful and great. It is what you should expect from somebody that you're working with. Peaches? they're mowing I mean how dare they mow you can probably see her in the window back there <laughs> oh who's that Michelle this is I went to a secondhand store the other day to pick up a little <laughs> table and the owner who used to be a patient of mine said to me I found a Scotty for you <laughs> this ginormous thing. wow so, oh my land out, Amy because I can't tell you how many <laughs> applause applause I would give you you did such a fantastic job today. This is exactly what I wanted. And I, I, um, we are going to get this up and, um, I promise you guys, we're going to probably be posting this even on Facebook somehow, if we can, because this is the stuff that we need to get out. You know, when people are asking you about how do I find a breeder, blah, blah, blah. How do I find a best, the best dog place, please share this kind of information with them. It's not all, all puppies are cute. They're all adorable. Um, and, and I'm, I'm just going to share a quick detail with you. I, I like Amy sometimes. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe you don't do this, Amy, but I sort of sit back in some groups sometimes and I start poking and prodding and asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was getting pressured to buy, to come and pick up a puppy last Sunday. 
Um, oh, and one of the other questions I always ask is, will you share the, the copy of your pedigrees of, of the dogs with me, of the parents? Mm -hmm. um, and it's always interesting what I see when that happens. So yeah. I would add that as another question. But I mean, and this, and this person out there claiming to be a breeder had stolen pictures from someone else. I won't name that person, but someone else who's on this call today. And not only pictures, but videos. So you guys have to be careful if you're looking at Facebook and yeah. choosing to go for something that's cheaper. Yeah. Dash has shown up on two other uh, Facebook pages as puppies. And so I immediately reported him to Facebook who go back and they say, yep, you posted it first. And they wipe out the whole page if a couple of people report them, but they will make new pages. Yeah. Um, so it's just important to, to definitely vet that. I'm not saying that somebody isn't trying, but if, when they're stealing, then I'm, that I'm done at that point. So, right. Yeah. Gotta love it. So, so there's a couple of questions here. I think we need to hit quickly if we have that time, maybe you so have time for a couple yep. more. Um, so, uh, Diane has a rescue thing that he's had a, a surgery already, um, for, it looks like uh, hip and knee issues. And she wasn't happy with, um, the way the clinic was run and if he has to have more work done she asked if you had any recommendations for finding uh, a good veterinary orthopedic surgeon and maybe that could apply to just you know, animal care in, in general like do you have any any recommendations or yeah. that you look for ask questions that you ask yeah for the for the unusual cases or ones or which there's been difficulty in the past um either the really big veterinary specialty groups, but also the veterinary schools of some of the most amazing surgeons and also the cost um, at veterinary schools tends to be lower um, and they will give you a team um, every time. And they also, the veterinary students at every uh, vet school that I've been to personally, the vet students also attend the dogs overnight, they're assigned. Um, and so that there's not just a technician online all night, but there is actually a veterinary student staring at your dog all night. Um, so th that's the two places that I always uh, look for. Some veterinary specialties you can self-refer, um, some you can't, but most vet schools you can self-refer um, and give them, have your veterinary information available so they can call them and get the records transferred over and review them, so. But yeah, there's, there's some amazing things going on right now. And one rescue that we placed who has, you know, interesting plumbing, um, just had his plumbing uh, redone, not redone because it had never been done um, at uh, Mizzou Veterinary School, um, what, two days ago, Vicki, I think. Um, and they kept thinking that he'd had revision surgery, um, but he was doing well. So revision was not recommended. Uh, and they kept saying, you know, why did they put that there? And it's like, well, that was the way he came. That's not the way the surgeon did it. But, um, but there, I'm amazed at what can be out there. We have a, a rescue that was placed that's got, I mean, elbows like this. I kid you not, they stick out like this. He lives in St. Louis and they're extremely uh, locked uh, and, and with major processes. He's, he's doing really, really well. Uh, we adopted out the dog years ago, but we didn't adopt out his elbows. And at whatever point he may need elbow surgery, that will, that will be covered. He may never need it. Um, but um, just like some dogs, we adopt out everything but their ears. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that can be taken care of. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I would definitely look at the large specialty centers and I would also look at the vet schools. So, thank you. Um, one, one more question, but before, before that, uh, Michelle, I just want to make sure people are asking if it's okay to post, um, I guess once this goes up on, on YouTube, if they can post it to their various sites and groups and things, which I'm assuming, yes, they, they can. Yeah, yeah, what I'd like to see is people put, post that link to our, the channel, but yeah, absolutely. The more we can share this information, the better. And then, um, Amy, there's a question here from Erica uh, related to something you were talking about, about like unfenced pools. Um, she, she mentioned other bodies of water on their property and 
no fence, who think it's okay to leave their dogs on fence and say that they will train them to stay on the property. Um, she doesn't place in those situations. <laughs> people get really angry and cause all yeah. kind of problems. How do you usually handle that? Um, okay. So after the example uh, of the people who said they had a fence, but then found out that their dogs had been hit by a car and they weren't using the fence, um, I adopted the policy after that when we have uh, a family that we don't know, we haven't adopted to them before, or they haven't already been fully vetted, right? Because sometimes people are fully sort of checked out and vetted, um, and they're just waiting for the right placement. Um, I always make it so that these dogs always have more vetting to do. They may be done, but I always tell potential people that have only uh, initial contact, but no real information that uh, this is, you know, where we're at. Um, if they've got, you know, a pond on their property or a pool on their property, they're already going to know from our rescue uh, information that it's going to have to be fenced. And of course, they get angry about it. I try to not even address that initially. Um, what I try to do is say, well, the dog doesn't have all their vetting. And then, you know, they sort of get hyped up about it. And then I find out about the pool and I sort of just ask some questions. And they say, yeah, we've always trained our dogs just to stay out of the pool. It's no big deal. Um, at that point, uh, I'll wait a day or so, and then I'll let them know that the dog is heartworm positive. Um, the dog isn't, um, but they will turn that dog down at that point because they don't want to create them for months. They don't want to deal with the, the cost and, and the time and treatment required. Um, and they'll then turn down that dog and they'll find one elsewhere. Because the the emails and such that I got, just like you probably did too, were really nasty. They were horrible. Like, how could you promise our family this dog? I never promised them anything. Um, in rescue, we don't promise them. And then puppies, I promise nobody anything. And you can ask that last litter. The puppies are eight weeks old before anybody knew what was happening. Because I didn't know what was happening. It was my litter. <laughs> I was going to do what I wanted. But I had no idea. So at that point, we did you know, the sort of the puppy sorting hat after that. And I was notifying people that they were getting a puppy and which one it was. Nobody quibbled about it because we did what we were doing. For rescue, people have more expectations. They're like, well, you know, they're just a rescue and you, you're going to want to get rid of them. And I get more people with that kind of bad attitude. So I'm on the front end, I always sort of withhold some information and I am not above telling a white lie to somebody who absolutely shouldn't have a dog that, you know, well, this dog is going to need a lot of health care. They will always back out. And then that saves you the time hassle and frankly, the harassment um, on that side. But um, yeah, it's, it's frustrating because they can say that, um, but I've never been able to fully train my dogs to do anything. Uh, you know, they may know it. Uh, and you can ask Luna, who uh, will not do it down in public. She'll do it in the house for 30 minutes. I could be dancing around with chicken. It doesn't matter. But I go somewhere else. She pretends like I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so she can't pass her therapy test and be a therapy dog because she can't do a, a, a sitter down in public. It's not allowed, in her opinion. Um, okay. <laughs> There's always some glick uh, in our dogs that is not going to be uh, taken over. So it's what it is. Thank you. I just posted the link to the Door County Scotty Rally YouTube page with the recordings of the previous Zoomies. So people you can copy that from there if you want, and we'll get this uh, posted as soon as, as, soon as possible. Um, Michelle's recording now, so we'll see how the recording comes out and then uh, get, it, get it posted as soon as we can. Cool. Okay, you guys, anybody have any last minute questions before we let Amy and the rest of you go? Terry, you terrific much. job, Amy. Thank you. Thank Amy. you very much. Yeah, and then message us anytime. We'll, uh, you know, where we're at. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, you guys. All right. We'll see you at our next Zoomie, which we Thanks, haven't. Michelle. Yet. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks.
Hi. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye, Bye Matt. Bye.